Institute. Uh, my name is Joanne Anderson and I'm a lecturer in art history here at the Institute. Um, I'm delighted that so many of you are able to join us this evening and hope that you will stay or continue to stay the course of the Origins of Art lecture series organised by myself and Hans Christian Hennis of the Build a Fat Soy Girl project also situated here at the Institute. This is lecture number three in our series and our speaker tonight is Paul Pettit who is Professor of Archaeology at Durham University. Paul is a specialist in European Middle and Upper Paleolithic art and moratory activity, so burial practices and rituals, with ex his expertise <coughs> extending to wider human behavioural patterns of the Neanderthal and Pleistocene members of our species. Rather excitingly, he discovered, as part of the investigatory team, Britain's only Paleolithic cave art at the Creswell Crags in the Midlands. He has worked on figurative and non-figurative art in the major fine spots of Europe, including many of those discussed by Steve Mithin and Jill Cook. So, you will be interested to hear about his perspective on any overlapping topics, and of course, maybe any clash of opinions. Um, the lectures are very <coughs> nicely as we go, just like the Lions and Chauvet, so with slight sort of intervals and production, of course. Um, Paul joined the archaeology department at Durham in 2013, Prior to that, he worked at Sheffield and Oxford Universities with his original PhD research at Cambridge, focusing on lithic technology <coughs> and what it could tell us about human behaviour. He has remained outside of the London orbital for his professional career, I would say, uh, but having taken his MA at UCL Archaeology just across the square, I wonder if he ever spared a thought to the Warburg Institute with its tradition of inquiry into the object matters of prehistoric image making and the origins of art since the directorship of Henri Francois from 1954. <coughs> Paul has published his findings and theories in books, The British Paleolithic, <coughs> Human Societies at the Edge of the Pleistocene World in 2012, and The Paleolithic Origins of Human Burial in 2010. <coughs> his most recent articles, and once again I find myself using that advisedly, which is quite frankly, the publication was this intimidating, um, is about the imagination that prehistoric archaeologists bring to their material. I will mention darkness visible, shadows art and the ritual experience, landscapes of the dead, shoot first, ask questions later. <laughs> He's also not afraid of asking the tough questions in the face of technological advance with the Chauvet conundrum are claims for the birthplace of art and mature back in 2009. So, <laughs> so tonight he's taking a fresh look at Ice Age art with his talk entitled Human Art, the first 30,000 years. New perspectives on Paleolithic cave art and the first human images. I've ever had, seriously. <laughs> and I've learned some stuff about myself. <laughs> I've forgotten. Uh, <laughs> and thank you so much to you two for inviting me to speak here at such an august institution. It, it really is genuinely a great honour, uh, particularly as I think the study into, as I would call it, Paleolithic art is not something uh, for a relatively small bunch of Paleolithic archaeologists who grew up looking at stone tool technology and this sort of thing. But it is truly uh, a multidisciplinary um, endeavour these days, particularly perspectives uh, from psychology, neuroscience, that um, I'll say something about at the very end. So thank you very much indeed uh, for that introduction. I was going to say that I, I did, I was aware of the war, uh, the Warburg, the Warburg uh, when I was at the Institute, although all I was thinking about stone tools in those days, so art was just something kind of, you know, modern and, uh, and <coughs> things. So um, it's lovely to uh, register what really goes on with uh, now. It's very tempting, I think, when one's speaking about these vast periods of time 
Paleolithic art, to present a kind of coffee table uh, approach which selects some of the, the wonderful bits of art, use terms like Sistine Chapel of the Paleolithic, this, that and the other, uh, and really you go away perhaps having seen some nice pictures uh, but not really getting into the depths of the, of the Paleolithic mind. But fear not, I'm not going to dispense with nice pictures, uh, I hope, but I'm going to give you my view on uh, how art originated and particularly how it changed over some 30,000 years uh, of the Pleistocene. I'm going to try to present it in what I think is a falsifiable hypothesis, that is to say, unlike much of speculation that occurs on this art, what it means, etc., uh, I like to think at least uh, we can dispense with all of my ideas, hopefully when I'm dead, something like that, but nevertheless, I'm setting it up uh, in that term. And these images will be explained a little bit too. To put us in perspective, of course, in the grand scheme of human evolution, art is a relatively late thing, or at least art in the sense we think about it. Uh, if we begin our quick uh, run through evolution, somewhere between six and seven million years ago, when the lineage leading to all extant and extinct humans split from that to the dead to the chimpanzees, we have this phase of upright walking as apes, little more, the Australopithecines that take us down to about two million years ago. The appearance of our own genus, actually nothing more than a, an erect walking ape with a slightly larger brain uh, than the ape norm, somewhere around 2 to 2.5 million years ago, depending on what fossils you uh, look at. By about 1.5 million years ago, we can see an essentially modern human in place. Brains about two thirds the size of our own now, upright bodies, modern body proportions, efficient walking, and so on. We might call this Homo erectus uh, in Eurasia, Homo ergaster uh, in Africa. And somewhat later on, from around 500,000, 600,000 years ago, uh, we can see this trend of increasing brain size uh, appearing both in Africa and in Eurasia in the form of Homo heidelbergensis. And it seems to be that Heidelbergensis comes under selection in northern latitudes, uh, like the rest of the biomass, to turn itself quite woolly in, the, in response to uh, increasing cold glacial, glacial interglacial cycles, and ultimately evolves into the Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis, whereas it undergoes very distinct evolutionary pressures, actually, to keep cool in warm tropical and subtropical latitudes in Africa, a process which uh, ultimately results in Homo sapiens, our own species, of course. And uh, the intriguing issue with these, these seem to be two parallel evolutionary processes, but nevertheless there, there are a number of similarities, not only in these brains that are ridiculously large relative to the body, so ridiculously expensive metabolically, um, but also in terms of some of the behaviours we can see manifested in the archaeological record. And really, since the middle of the 20th century, scholars have been divided as to whether they see the Neanderthals being effectively the same as Homo sapiens uh, in terms of their cognitive abilities, behaviour and so on, or whether uh, they really are the poor relatives uh, and so on. There's been a lot of Homo sapiens-centric uh, interpretation here. And this is germane to this topic today because it's really only in the last 10 years that evidence is picking up uh, to show that Neanderthals were using pigments at least, using markings uh, which bring them, if not into the realm of figurative art, at least closer to us in terms of the, the material culture uh, of visual expression. So it's really this last period that I'm going to be dealing with here, let's say for the sake of argument, the last 100,000 
years ago, and particularly in Europe, when our own species, an African one, disperses into that continent and the resulting Upper Paleolithic uh, that we leave behind us. And formally speaking, of course, this is the latter end of the Pleistocene, the Upper Pleistocene, as we call it, the last glacial interglacial cycle. So if we go back in the longer sense, and I'm sure you've seen some of these examples from Steve Mythen and perhaps from Jill Cook too, there are very few pointers towards any evidence of artistic activity among pre-modern, pre sapiens humans. Pretty much the earliest there is, and it is one shell, and dates to about half a million years ago, uh, is evidence of some kind of regularised engraved markings, as you can see here on this shell. This was actually excavated in the 1890s by a Dutchman, Eugene Dubois, who famously located at this location of Trinil remains of Homo erectus, as it came to be known. So a very archaic modernish looking human and evidence of its predatory behaviors in the landscape. One of the foodstuffs Homo erectus was exploiting and, and Trinil uh, were edible mollusks and one of these shells came to be uh, covered in these engravings. They are deliberate engravings created by stone tools. I'm sure Francesco Derrico will be saying a lot more about this sort of thing. That's it. Make of it what you will. It's not the marks that are left by using a stone tool to open these mollusks or anything like that. And I think you'll agree it's regular and so on. People will easily say that this is emerging symbolism and so on. I'll come back to that in a second. It is regular marking. <coughs> I don't know whether that indicates someone who's bored uh, and you know, is quite used to butchering animals in a fairly systematic way, and this is a, a, a relatively unconscious process. Just to mark that trillion engraving that really stands out. But between about half a million years ago and about 350,000 years ago, we have three or four objects uh, which are natural almost entirely but which have been modified very slightly in order to bring out, to exaggerate, their resemblance to the human form. Probably the oldest is this one here. It's a little volcanic two for vol solidified volcanic ash pebble. It's only about three and a half centimetres uh, in size, and I hope you agree it looks vaguely anthropomorphic. And actually, the neck area has been incised with a stone tool to make it look more like a distinct head. And there's been a few scrapings of it uh, as well. This is very clear, and Francesco uh, did the study uh, on this. So clearly someone around, probably around 400, 500,000 years ago, very precise data here, very round, uh, saw this, recognized one assumes a human shape, and just brought out a little bit there. And we have exactly the same kind of process occurring on yet another natural cobble, this port site, uh, a little larger, just under six centimetres in maximum dimension from Morocco at the open air campsite of Tantan, about 400,000 years. And I think you'll agree that, uh, again, it looks humanoid and some of these markings that separate the head from the torso uh, emphasize the legs and so on have been brought out using a stone tool. And again, people have said very much about these, you know, this is about <coughs> symbolism, this sort of thing. Well, to me, maybe we can infer that their message, if they had one, uh, was, I look like a human or something like that. We needn't necessarily infer very much uh, about them. And certainly given that these objects are non-perishable, the fact that we don't have lots more of them probably says more about the uh, capacities in the symbolic realm of 
homohyaluronensis at this time. It's interesting that these are recognisably humanoid bodies. In terms of pigment use, we have a record of fragments of red ochre uh, crayons, if you like, going back to about half a million years ago in Africa and in Eurasia. So we know people were retaining and using, we don't know how, red colorants. But this, at this open air camp in Limburg in the southern uh, Netherlands of Maastricht, uh, we actually have evidence not just of red ochre being used in the form of this lump here but the fact that this was actually an ochre paint because it is a series of drips of a wet paint here. So this isn't just finding little crayons, little lumps of red ochre, carrying it around, colouring oneself for fun with them and so on. This is deliberate production by grinding the ochre into a powder and then, of course, mixing it up with water. It's found dropped, all these dots, are these drips of red ochre? This is what I just showed you. We have a photograph uh, in situ. In the course of the typical rubbish, stone tools, butcher handle bones, and so on, left by early Neanderthals about a quarter of a million years ago uh, at Maastricht. In Africa, it's really from 100,000 years ago, and we're dealing with early members of Homo sapiens now, that the picture of pigment use, the ochre use, really picks up. And excavations by Chris Henshawood in the cave of Blombos on the Cape Coast of South Africa, which has a remarkable stratigraphy spanning the period from about 120,000 years ago here, effectively to the Holocene, the last few thousand years at the very top. So it's extremely well excavated and very well dated. And from this horizon here, dated to approximately 100,000 years ago by two techniques uh, here, we have not only a lot of crayons, as it were, of red ochre. Actually, I don't know if you can make it out here, but a lot of these levels are actually stained with ochre. So much of it being used. But we actually have two of these abalone shells, and inside of one, and associated with another, uh, these grinding stones of quartzites, again stained with ochre as well. So this is a production technique for it as well. So archaeologists are great at bigging their data up. This is a complex industry of production of uh, an ochre pigment here at Blombos. And in actual fact, this isn't unique to that particular level there. As we come up the sequence into deposits trending down to about 70, 75,000 years ago, we have continued numbers of these ochre crayons. There's a one centimetre scale uh, here, which actually have engraved marks on them, rather similar to what we see on that shell in Trinil. I'm not making any. Uh, linear connection there, but we have several dozen uh, of these uh, now excavated fairly recently. And archaeologists speak of symbolism, speak of these being traditions, because uh, there are a number that look quite similar, uh, you know, these kind of groupings uh, of incised lines and so on. Some of them, I'm sure, are fortuitous, in that if you're grinding ochre to make powder, to make, therefore, a paint, you'll leave a number of incisions on it. And perhaps out of that simple act comes the notion that you can actually do something a little more regular as well. And in the literature, we find examples of people talking about registers with infill chevrons and this sort of thing. And before you know it, you have a virtual written language here, uh, according to some people. Well, we can see this repeated in other caves as well. We're now uh, as late as 60,000 uh, years ago, and we're not looking at ochre fragments, but we're le looking at fragmentary remains of ostrich eggshells that probably functioned as water containers, as they have done for the Kalahari sand uh, ever since. And as you can see, we have these registers within the fields, these bands. Uh, if you like, on them too. This is from a different site, the Clove. 
uh, not too far away, uh, from Brahmas. So evidence is beginning to accumulate that this kind of marking was being produced over several tens of thousands of years during the early evolution of Homo sapiens, at least in South Africa. But equally, we can see, as I said earlier, over the last 10 years or so, increasing evidence for Neanderthal use of pigments, at least. Some claims are a little more dubious. This is a cobble of flint from an open air site in the south of France, Roche Cotard. It's got a natural hole through it, an erosional hole through it, you know, you find on the beach, pe flint pebbles with holes in, like so. But a horse rib has wound up wedged in it, and it's clearly a snapped fragment of a horse rib. And it was published. Um, as a potential Neanderthal face, you know, a Neanderthal attempt to indicate a face. Now, I know I'm in the Warburg Institute, you all have your own ideas about what depictions of the human face should be like. That's, that's, I know Neanderthals probably weren't that attractive either, but that one uh, actually looks pretty odd. To me, I mean, actually, if you look at the site, it's full of these cobbles with natural holes in and so on. It looks like it's probably fortuitous. Uh, anyway, it's nice to use um, for those of you interested in the in the history of um, prehistoric art and so on. Gabriel de Mortier, um, one of the great pioneers in the 19th <coughs> century of Paleolithic archaeology, when the first examples of Paleolithic art were authenticated, he noted how they are already quite sophisticated. And he said, you know, so l'enfance de l'art, ce n'est pas l'art de l'enfant. Beautiful little phrase, which we can turn uh, against the Russian But anyway, on firmer grounds, we now have several sites uh, across Europe in which Neanderthals were clearly using a restricted amount of shells, marine shells, uh, for personal ornamentation. They pierced them, and so presumably they're wearing them or sewing them onto clothing, uh, even like this fanciful construction here. Uh, we also have lots of sites with crayons, not of ochre, but of manganese dioxide. They're black colorant there too. Of course, we don't know what they're using them for, other than as a color that we assume. And in Spain, we have several sites now uh, which show that they were using ochre, red ochre, and including um, fragments of these large bivalve shells that are stained on their interior with ochre that show that they were used as containers to carry around, rather like little compacts, uh, I like to think. And again, at several, fight, at several <coughs> sites uh, left by Neanderthals, most famously at the Grotta di Fumani in, uh, in northeast Italy, we have the remains of predatory bird bones, wing bones, that have cut marks left from stone tools that show that feathers have been very carefully removed. Corvids, uh, this kind of the eagles, raptors basically. So we assume, um, given that they're not using these one assumes to write with or anything like that, that they were using feathers for decorations. A very nice reconstruction uh, of a Neanderthal uh, from uh, the Human Evolution Museum of Burgos. Uh, in Spain. So Neanderthals were clearly using colorants, two different colors uh, and so on, but of course we have no direct evidence what they were doing with that. I'll only I'll skate over this because I'm sure Francesco, who was uh, the lead author in the study of these marks, and I know Steve Mythe uh, has mentioned them, we have these engraved lines. I know it's not impressive, uh, but uh, these uh, seem to have been made by Neanderthals. They are definitely <coughs> made very, very painstakingly uh, by humans, by a stone tool. Uh, that is no problem. Frank, when Francesco says it is, it is. But there is <coughs> a question with the dating. I refereed this and I've dug in this cave, Gorham's Cave in Gibraltar. And they're found right at the back of the cave where this deposit feathers out, as we call it. And there's been lots of processes of deflation and, uh, and so on uh, in the cave, sediments 
expand and form and so on over these vast periods of time. And this was covered by just 20 centimetres of this deposit that is assumed to be much larger and date to at least 35,000 years ago. So I questioned this, actually having off the record discussed this with Francesca, and um, not only was it not addressed when the paper was published, uh, but that 20 centimetres had become 40 centimetres. Mm -hmm. So, you know, make of it what you will. But it's times that you wonder why you are accepting um, requests to referee things. You know. So anyway, definitely in grave lines, the age is open to question. But Francesco, I'm sure, will have more to say about that. What I'm really going to talk about uh, today is the art left by Homo sapiens. And that is to say, the art left by Homo sapiens as we disperse in several ways uh, out of Africa, up the Nile Valley, eastwards first, and then uh, only last, sorry, that's Europe, sorry. For those of you who are uh, paying attention there, this is Africa, yes I know. Uh, and uh, actually dispersed that way eastwards, and then only relatively late, between about 50 and 40,000 years ago, uh, up into Europe, and even Britain, uh, with a little band of holiday makers who make it about 35,000 years uh, ago. So actually, figurative art, at least based on current evidence, emerges first at the time that Homo sapiens is dispersing through the old world. If it's correct that Neanderthals were producing it, it raises the question as to whether they are interacting with Homo sapiens. I'm not going to say anything about that, I think it's an old debate, and in my opinion it's very obvious that Neanderthals have become extinct, for whatever reason, everywhere we look, prior to the arrival of Homo sapiens. So it's not an issue of contact and acculturation, as people call it. But nevertheless, the figurative art, at present, only demonstrably relates to the behaviour Homo sapiens. Now, don't worry, this is the worst slide I have. I'm just going to go through some of the assumptions we make, and I'm not going to talk my way through it. If you can, just concentrate on the red bits, and we don't need to go through it all. One of my real problems is that archaeologists, and I think it's fair to say, our people in other disciplines looking at the archaeopalaeolithic record, will look at anything like we've just seen and assume it's symbolic. And indeed, those of us who work on the origin of Homo sapiens uh, it, have really come to take it as dogmatic that if there is one thing that defines Homo sapiens, perhaps distinguishes Homo sapiens uh, from other humans, it is a symbolic capacity, as it's usually called, or symbolic behaviour. So this is just to show you some of the examples of how we get away. And I think we've been really hamstrung by this folk, is something symbolic or not, you know. So here we have, this is left by Neanderthals uh, in the Near East, we just have a series of semicircles, if you like, nested semicircles, which is, according to one of the late um, leading experts on this, a symbolic composition, uh, and earliest figurative art, important proxy for advanced symbolic communication or um, accumulation of markers for modern behaviour of which symbolism uh, is part. And also people will assume that just digging a shallow grave and sticking a body in it and covering it up again is symbolic as well. I think you get the, the idea, I won't bore you with going through the rest there, but my point is, is that sure at some point symbolism as we would understand it, must be emerging in this period, but just because we have things like good nature and so on, that doesn't mean that that's indicative uh, of symbolism. My second problem uh, is the relative degree of paradigmatic closedness uh, of the archaeological world. We've grown up in this paradigm that Neanderthals were stupid and we were obviously brilliant as we tap-danced our way across the old world for the first time. 
But it is, of course, a totally open scientific question <coughs> as to whether Neanderthals produce figurative art and what have you, right? The fact that we don't have any evidence for it, of course, uh, doesn't necessarily reveal anything because it's, the record has changed so much over the last 10 years. Now this, I'll come back to later, uh, is a publication on our work on the dating of cave art in which we obtained the oldest minimum ages for examples of cave art at least 40,000 years ago. And as we say here, uh, remembering these are minimum ages saying that the art must be at least 40,800 uh, years old or more. We can't rule out that the earliest paintings were symbolic expressions of the Neanderthals, which we know actually lasted until about 42,000 years ago. Equally, we said you know, these minimum ages reveal either cave art was part of the cultural repertoire of the first Homo sapiens in Europe or that perhaps Neanderthals also engage in painted cave. And of course, there's a furore um, when we publish this and the media concentrate on the fact that they're saying this is Neanderthals and so on, which it isn't, of course. I'm sure a lot of people willfully uh, misinterpreted this. But it is an open issue, and it will change this year, certainly. So we will be talking about very different scenarios for the origins of art in a few months' time. But back to these traditions uh, and symbolic uh, lines and this sort of thing. Well, needless to say, uh, we have a very good uh, record of what chimpanzees are capable of doing. This is all chimpanzee art. One of the first studies of a chimpanzee, a uh, note from the 50s, noted that, that Vicky, the adult uh, female, you know, would play around with pretty much anything that was put in the room with her, including, notice, scribbles as well as <coughs> scribbles uh, too. They don't necessarily need uh, to imply much more or less uh, than our long lost cave uh, images there too. So it's very dangerous, of course, uh, just to look at these things and assume that we're dealing with a, a symbolic and capacitated human. And it seems to me, and I'm no specialist on symbolism, but there are different levels of it. We can use pigments, think of those red ochre crayons and so on, simply to decorate. You know, I'll colour my face red because I think it makes me look better. Something like that. We might use a similar kind of thing to make a very simple message, which I would call enhancement. In other words, I'm going to put red ochre all over me because I know that makes me look strong and impressive. And it's probably going to have an effect on you all and that sort of thing, other than thinking what a fool. But, you know, I am basically enhancing a message I want to put out. Not exactly fully symbolic, is it? Or we might come to a level that I would call accessorization. So we would have a natural message here in which can be nuanced by it. Let's say, I'm a member of a football club and I colour my clothing red uh, like my colleagues so we know we're all on the same side. It doesn't necessarily have to have any additional uh, symbolic function. But obviously then we come into full symbolism and fully symbolic, symbolic activity that I think most archaeologists think of in which time and space and myth can be interpreted into artistically recognisable message. The question is, of course, how on earth do we go about identifying these from fragments of ochre, drips of paint, lines on shells and so on? Well, this is one of the issues. The way we start, of course, is assuming it must be at the most simplistic range until proven otherwise, uh, if you like. So putting this together, this is my hypothesis about how art, and I use the word very, very generally, evolved. I assume that the most sensible place for any kind of decoration and so on uh, to begin is on the body. Even chimpanzees actually show an interest when you, you know, put them under, uh, put a blob of red ochre uh, on their, um, what's that, forehead. 
and, uh, and then wake them up and put them in the mirror, you know, and so on. So it doesn't surprise me that this kind of thing would be occurring uh, from very old, uh, very old um, uh, indeed, so at least half a million years ago. And perhaps from somewhere before 100,000 years ago, I suggest that that body decoration begins to be extended to small objects that are routinely around the body. Those objects that are very, very close. Those objects, of course, that are being used to create, to, to ornament, to decorate those bodies uh, as well. Perhaps those objects that become accessories to display, to um, accessorise the body. And then, from somewhere before 40,000 years ago, on present evidence, certainly by 40,000 years ago, art becomes, as I would call it, installed in the landscape. Or to put it another way, it stops being part of a face-to-face -face and becomes part of place. And at the moment, our evidence is that it is Homo sapiens that did that first. But as I say, I think the situation is going to change. So looking at some of the earliest examples of this, uh, or at least of the installation uh, phase, these date to about 36 to 37,000 years ago, in the figurative sense. In either as engravings that were originally on the ceilings or back walls of rock shelters that were the backdrop to campsites such as this one in the, the Castanet rock shelter in the Dordogne, uh, quite deeply incised lines. Can you see this uh, here? Uh, it's a circle, a bit like a horseshoe, with a line there, um, which are usually called vulvas by male Paleolithic archaeologists. Um, they could be hoofprints, as somebody jokingly said. Uh, some of them are vulvas, when we have, shall we say, more of an engraved context. Uh, they're, they're always in the right position, so to speak. But nevertheless, some kind of tradition that we have. And similarly, we have these very simple painted outlines. Can you see this anthropomorph up here? On blocks that were originally part, again, of the ceiling of the Ufumani uh, rock shelter. We're now much later than the, the Neanderthals' occupation of the cabin with their bird uh, feathers. Uh, but with, with modern humans uh, painting the scenes of the canyon. In the cold conditions of the Pleistocene, these things come shattering off, thankfully for us archaeologists, into dateable archaeological levels. But they're very, very simple. There's some kind of oval there too. No doubt people would call that a vulva uh, as well. Some kind of quadruped there too. These really do stand out as being quite simple, uh, quite straightforward not particularly naturalistic, but they are bodies. And also when we have our first appearance of portable art, small carvings in low relief or in the round, they are also depicting the humanoid body. And in fact, throughout the whole canon of art of the Paleolithic, the humanoid body is remarkably rare. These are very small. This soapstone, which you can see on display in the Natural History Museum in Vienna, uh, is about so big. Uh, this one here is about an inch uh, in height. It's a, a shattered fragment uh, of a long bone uh, of a reindeer. Uh, and you can see this humanoid image. Note these markings here, almost as if it's representing bangles uh, or scarification tattooing and so on. And I don't propose to talk very much about so-called Venus figurines, horrible term, but our earliest form, only discovered a few years ago, of a vaguely uh, humanoid female with large breasts. Uh, this is the navel area, large hips. Uh, and instead of a head, uh, this piercing one seems for uh, suspension. But they are signs of the body at least. The only one thing that stands out, potentially, uh, in this is the spectacular art of the Chauvet Cave in Ardèche. 
which has over 400 images. It's charcoal drawings. People usually call it paintings. It's not. It's charcoal drawings using all of the techniques we see in modern charcoal drawing, including smoothing, uh, shading, and this sort of thing. And radiocarbon dates from a very small number of these charcoal images uh, have come out in the order of 36,000 years old, which is the, um, the dogmatic opinion uh, of its uh, age. And no doubt, if Steve Mython and Jill Cook have either talked about Chauvet, they would have said uh, that it's that old. But there are so many problems with it that it really <coughs> certainly cannot be. I won't say much about this, but I can take questions on it, and I even got a few slides to, to counter them, because this is a serious image. If Chauvet is really that old, it throws out of the window overnight everything we thought we understood about the evolution of art. But it isn't. The big problem is the dating technique using charcoal. Because with radiocarbon dating of charcoal, what we're dating is the creation of that charcoal, the fire. We are dating the fire that turned wood into charcoal. And that's fine if you have a half here, such as that discovered on the floor of Chauvet Cave. You date a piece of charcoal from in the middle of that, and it comes out to, well, 36,000 calendrical years, then that's fine. Somebody lit that fire that created that charcoal then. But then, and this is what I was always, always joke with my students, until amazingly I came across this PP on a cave in southern <coughs> Spain that any of us in this room could go into that cave, pick up a little <coughs> charcoal from this, and write, Paul was here, and then go away. And then an archaeologist would come along, scrape a bit from that letter away very carefully, and go and date it. And it would date to 32,000 radiocarbon years old, and they would assume that Paul Pettit, he looks old, but boy, you know, <laughs> perhaps he's actually aging quite well for that, and they had language, uh, you know, uh, and this sort of thing. Seriously, that is a limitation that many of my colleagues really don't get. It's called the old charcoal problem. So we need, of course, to make that assumption that the time that charcoal was produced is the same as the time it was used to create art. And this is the fundamental issue with uh, Chauvet, where it cannot uh, be right. What we can do now, thankfully, is use a technique that's been with us since the 60s, but is now so refined, we can use minimal samples. And this is not dating pigments from the art itself, but is it dating calcite flowstones? stalactites, stalagmites, that have formed over the art. So we can use a method we call uranium thorium, it's a radioactive principle, to tell us how old stalactite is. And if we can therefore take samples of that stalactite where it overlies art, we can obtain minimum ages for it. And that's why I've started talking in minimum ages. And there are various ways that chemically and physically we can actually understand that we are getting really good dates we can be very confident in. But they are minimal. Or in the cases where art has been done on a nice stalactite, maximum ages. So we're working with that. And this uh, shows us some of the uh, examples that we and colleagues have been able to produce. This is the great panel of hands in El Castillo cave. Uh, in Cantabria, uh, there are about 30 hand stencils, more of those in a sec, and we have two dates showing that they were created over 40,000 years ago. We don't know whether it was you know, 40,000 years and a month, or 80,000 years, 1 million years, or whatever. That's an open issue, more on that uh, later too. And colleagues also, interestingly, have obtained minimum ages for hand stencils again, not in Europe, but in Sulawesi over in East Asia, of a similar minimum age, which suggests that the creation of hand stencils may have been part of the behavioural repertoire of Homo sapiens as we were dispersing 
as we so to speak, were dispersing out of Africa and across the old world for the first time. And this is the process being done here, just to show the minimal size of samples we do. We don't damage the art at, at all, of course. We scrape the, the calcite off and we result in a sample that's about five millimetres square, slightly off-coloured, that will then weather back to its normal stalactite colour and so on. So it's ideal from the point of view of conservation of the family of the art. I don't know if you can see it, there's a hand stencil there, that's in Malcha the ASOK in the centre uh, of Spain. So it's a very reliable technique. We argue far more reliable than radiocarbon because the only assumption we need to make, which we can demonstrate, is that the art must be older than the stalactite that we're dating that grew on top of it. You don't have to make those assumptions about fire and uh, uh, creation of art and this sort of thing. So, moving into the caves uh, themselves, the important point about cave art is there's absolutely no quotidian reason to be in these dark, dangerous environments. There is absolutely nothing to be obtained there from the point of view of survival. One could argue water, uh, but we really wouldn't want to drink water. Uh, about a year ago, working in Spain with a colleague, um, he uh, developed food poisoning, thought it was the prawns, but we both had the prawns, and other people shared them and so on, and we agreed that it can't be those. He said, well, I did drink some water from the lake in the cave today, and oh, that'll probably be it then you know, things defecate in it, things die and rot uh, in it. So there is absolutely nothing to be gained. If you want a drink, yeah, you can lick water. <coughs> stalactites, of course, but it's going to be a long time doing that. In the river outside, or the snow outside uh, will probably help you. Anyway, so the point is these are being explored for a reason, and it needs a lighting technology, of course. And we find evidence of this naturally uh, concave uh, objects, like the base of a stalactite here, with the remains of uh, combustion uh, in it. These ones more important. <coughs> These are the typical lamps, precursors, I suppose, of Roman uh, lamps. That lit the way quite literally. Either that or torches. I've taken this from the original Frankenstein. Uh, and we get, thankfully, rather like, rather like cigarettes that build up ash and we flick it off, uh, you have the same principle writ large with torches, uh, and you stub those against the wall of the cave. And we can date those because, of course, that is dating the burning, the creation of the charcoal. So we can actually date the present, the timing of the presence of humans in cave using these <coughs> torch wipes. And these are some examples uh, of the lamps that have been found on the cave floor of Lasco. Everybody talks about Lasco. They don't talk about its archaeology. Uh, analysis of the resins, uh, of the, um, uh, the residues rather, uh, show that um, birch and pine uh, and juniper woods were being used. I'm pleased to see online that you can still buy juniper and pine candles. So you can still, you know, authentically uh, check out what it was like. The point is the light of these is going to be no more than a two metre diameter, flickering, moving. And that's a very important point when we start looking at art, because no one in the Paleolithic, of course, would have seen art in the depths of caves, in the stationary way we see it today on PowerPoints, in books, and for that matter in electrically lit areas. Just while we're on uh, Lasco, there are two beautifully made red sandstone uh, lamps uh, from there. They are unique. We have fragments of these. The Corres seems to have been a little centre for the production of these red sandstone lamps. Rather nice there. There's the impression uh, of one as it's been uh, lifted on the cave floor. And there's an experimental one there too. And note also these uh, engraved markings symbols, as they're called, uh, on this. The reason why I bring this up is because if we look at the distribution of lamps uh, in Lascaux, most of them are down the bottom of the shaft at the back of the system, where we have this very weird uh, thing uh, here. 
I don't intend to talk about it, but it seems to be, have been lit by a couple of dozen of these lamps flicking around. And also, uh, 11 of them uh, were actually piled along the wall of the, uh, the so-called nave here. This is the thing. It's a very low area, so the art is actually quite eroded where animals uh, have walked by, you know, cave bears and this sort of thing. Uh, but the, the lamps seem to have been lined along it, so it's lit up as a tableau if you like. So it starts looking at the, the ways in which these things were seen. We know at Lascaux the archaeology on its floor is contemporary uh, with the art on its walls because we can link these symbols here too. Here's the lamp, here's some engravings uh, on the wall with this similar nested uh, image uh, here too. And this is the fragment of a sagai, a reindeer antler javelin head uh, with the same there. Uh, as well. This is the way that we establish a degree of contemporaneity with whatever's on the cave floor or in its archaeological departments uh, and what's on its walls. But actually, caves can be dangerous, that's probably over exaggerated, but they can certainly be very difficult to navigate around in. Uh, this is a shot of Lagana, which, under which one needs to do a 20 metre vertical drop down uh, into. Uh, which is worrying enough uh, with modern technology. Imagine that with a little rope and plaited horse hair. You get the idea of the kind of risks that people are undertaking. But actually exploring these places, as I'm well aware, is highly tactile. I was constantly putting my hands out flat uh, when, uh, to steady myself and so on. And this kind of tactile exploration seems uh, to have a role in the emergence of the early star. And it's only now, as we roll out these new dating techniques, that we have in place an emerging picture for the origins uh, of cave art itself. The earliest art for which we have this oldest evidence is non-figurative. There is an emerging picture of a non-figurative phase uh, to our art that could be significantly older than this. It's left, interestingly, I would say, by extensions of the human body. It's almost like my hypothetical body art is now being extended in the form of these hand stencils and also just the use of fingers dipped in paint to create dots or lines. Body signs, one could call it. It's only from about 36, 37,000 years ago that, that we have the first evidence of what we could call figurative art. This is simple <coughs> outlines of animals in rock art, but quite highly achieved three-dimensional sculpture on mammoth ivory, typically, uh, in some regions of Europe, not all. But when we have these animals uh, in outline, they're usually quite naturalistic, very, very short on unlike those examples I saw from the very start of this period. But it's really only from about 32,000 years ago, when we come into the mid-upper Paleolithic, the so-called Gravettian, that we can really see naturalism um, becoming, uh, to, coming to the fore, and really the dominance of animals in the art that is so characteristic of the upper Paleolithic. And I just put the lovely little Venus of Poisson, really one of the icons, uh, Paleolithic art as she, uh, as it were, belongs to this phase. And it's only from 22,000 years ago that we get all of the wonders of Paleolithic art, such as Lascaux, Altamira, Neo, and also a lot of the portable art that perhaps Jill Cook um, spoke about uh, as well. And also the use of different, you know, several colours, sculpted friezes of life-sized animals, and also the depiction of movement, the use of perspective, note that this rainbow is in front of uh, the other one there, and anything that we might call scenes uh, as such. And 95% of Upper Paleolithic art is late Upper Paleolithic, Solutrian, Magdalenian, uh, using the terms we tend to use. So the big message is that the overwhelming dominance of animals in the canon of Upper Paleolithic art 
humanoid depiction. I use this term humanoid very deliberately. because Just because you get something that looks like a human, of course, doesn't necessarily imply it is a human. But art that it looks like a human is remarkably rare. And it is always problematic. Is it really a human? It looks a bit animal-like. Is it a mixture of both and so on? Unlike all of our animals, which are very obviously bison, like this example from Neo that might have been richly killed, uh, if you like. It's, or they're very obviously a horse, like this carved reindeer and for spear thrower from the French Pyrenees. Or very obviously uh, a doe, a female, doing a of a fish as well. So they get it right with the animals, and this is the thing they're most obviously thinking of. Psychologists will tell us, of course, that the brain may be wired to interpreting things as animals because of our evolutionary heritage, heritage, uh, heritage uh, uh, and so on. So the dominant <coughs> animals are horse, there's the nearest living equivalent to a Pleistocene horse, the so-called Schabalski's horse, and we see often a lot of detail uh, coming out showing uh, the importance of identifying marks like peelage on our depictions here. There's another different type of horse from Lascaux uh, as well. Uh, too. The now extinct wild cattle, aurochs, which we tend to think is a bit like a cow, it really isn't, as you can see uh, from this nice one uh, in Portugal uh, here. So really quite magnificent. And a one and a half tons uh, of cow, an aggressive cow there too. And cervids, usually red deer, like these ones. Look at these two confronting all rocks. They are just about to have an almighty headache uh, between them. But in the centre behind them, this lovely little group uh, of great big old red deer stags, magnificent animals there. That's the canon, the trio, the holy trinity of animals depicted uh, in Cana. There are others which are less important. We tend to think of reindeer as iconic. Most reindeers are actually depicted on portable art, actually, and are relatively late, like the one we've already seen. I thought Jill might talk about that because it's curated in the British Museum, uh, in fact, although I don't think it's on uh, display. Also, bison, depending on where you are, if you're in the north of the Pyrenees, it's bison territory. And Neo is very famous. Uh, for these depictions, but we also have three-dimensional sculptures on mammoth ivory, and these to which I'll return uh, from the scene of Alton near my cave. I'll just, while we're at it, two bison having the typical head-to-head -head fight uh, as well. Ibex, if we're in montane areas as well, and they are actually remarkably strong animals too. You tend to think of those cute little things like you might see in a rare breed seal or something like that. They'll give you a nice broken leg and so on. And here's back at uh, Lasco, two of them confronting uh, with a sign, so called, in between them. We have this quite a lot in Lasco the juxtaposition of a non figurative sign uh, and figurative animals. Now, if that was a Sumerian cuneiform tablet, and that a sheep, and that a sign, somebody will be calling that writing, or proto-writing in some way. And in fact, uh, it does seem that there's a degree of regularity to these uh, juxtapositions in Lascaux, El Castillo, one or two other caves, that suggest that these, perhaps, are qualifying something. Uh, about maybe that's the sign for headache, uh, or something like that. Mammoth, of course, we tend to think is iconic as well. It's a relatively rare component of the art. It exists. We even have a depiction of a mammoth in Spain. It shows you how cold uh, things could be uh, at the time. But it's quite easy when we put these in context, in their ethological context, uh, to see how myths may arise. Because, of course, uh, using modern analogies, ibex will obviously disappear up to the top of the mountains. These are the pyramids. Um, this is the, I've uh, taken this from just outside the entrance of Neo uh, Cave. Uh, they will disappear from the point of view of Upper Paleolithic hunter gatherers, they would disappear into the sky for certain times of the year and then come back down from the sky. It's quite easy to see how one could easily uh, incorporate myths uh, about these. 
and also horse and mice and migrate along these valleys between winter and summer grazing grounds and so on. Uh, they come together for having fun, scrapping uh, and having sex, of course, which I assume both are quite important to our upper page of the country gatherers. So it's easy to see how uh, you know, they could sympathise, as it were, empathise with these animals and out of those myths which art functions as part of the rise. Now the triggers, if I'm, am I right for another 10 minutes? Am I right to say? Yeah? Okay. okay. Just nod off if you're having enough of it. Just some of the triggers for this, one thing that we can see is a really important element, or rather are important elements, a pareidolia, whereby the human brain is predisposed to see meaning in natural shapes. The face of God in a cloud, um, the Virgin Mary in a slice of toast, and, and, and all this sort of thing. That was our conversation with the Virgin Mary. And we can see that at work quite a bit in caves too, where natural features that resemble you know, the back of a horse or whatever are brought out in art to, to resemble that. A bit like those Pierre Figueroa's earlier. Cynic Doki is employed quite a lot. Most of the images we have in cave art are incomplete, often just enough of an animal done to make it unambiguously identifiable. With mammoths, it's classic. You imagine an uppercase letter M, but asymmetrical. You do one curve and a second. You've got it, the dome of its skull and its shoulder and back. Sometimes that will suffice. Get the impression that it, the, these aren't artists in the sense, of course, of creating a masterpiece, stepping back and admiring it, and it being there in perpetuity. It's perhaps the act of creation that's important or rather what that act was invented in. And also abstraction to varying degrees, particularly as we go on through this period as well. Just two examples here, this, this you use for the, uh, the poster. This is a natural stomach-type column in El Castillo Cave. Can you see it's got this area here that resembles an upright bison, and indeed an upright bison has been painted on in manganese. To fit it, does that make sense? Horns, head, shoulder, its rear, little tail, its legs, its rear legs stretched out, and then its front legs curved. Can you make that out? <laughs> I have to take my word for it, if not, if, okay, you can. Uh, but not only that, if you shine a light, as has been done in this, uh, this photo across this, it projects this upright bison. You see? Look at that. And the leg, you're all seeing it now, that's paradonia working. And that's why it's so easy to convince people about this. You want to see these shapes, don't you? You know, but uh, this is some of the, the ambiguities that we actually see. And furthermore, yes, I hear you thinking, well, that could be just accident. This top of the stalactite has been modified by being hammered uh, with a stone to create this little thing that forms the horn. As well. So it's a little ensemble, a beautiful example of how shadow plays a role in these things. And it's a completely different thing. Engravings, very common image, uh, these engraved on little plaquettes that were used as carpeting, if you like, uh, of tent structures on the, on the campsite on the Rhine, about 15,000 years old, in Gunnersdorf. We find them in a number of sites. They're called uh, Gunnersdorf type females. They tend not to have heads. There's a lower back, I'm sorry, upper back, lower back, very projecting buttocks. Then they lose interest as they come to the knee or just below the knee. And then we have the front, the pubic area, the waist, a breast, which may or may not be present, and then upper, <coughs> no head. They often lack breasts, they often lack heads, and they can be stylized as much that they look like a lowercase letter B or D. And so on. There's actually two of them you can probably make out here as well. So, this is the kind of abstraction uh, that becomes really a sign almost. It's a figurative art turning into a sign. We can also see that natural features, this is the paradolia, are incorporated. This is a very large block of limestone in Pechereau Cave in the Lot department of France. See, the edge of it resembles the head of horse. And on these 
painted, as it were, actually spat. This has been created by spitting, like so. Uh, the so-called spotted horses, very famous. Note they've got hand stencils here. This actually sits in there as well. Lovely example of pareidolia. They're often called uh, spotted horses because people have suggested they, that these are zebroid-like horses. Uh, that, uh, they're often called daffodil-like. They're not. They're spotted. The spots actually occur outside the bodies of the animals as well. But this just just to, to show actually that we're used to these kind of images in coffee table books. But actually, if you look at the curvature of these things, there's a greater dynamism to it. We actually have a date on charcoal that was used to touch this up. And that was done with using charcoal dating when we calibrated to 30,000 years ago. So these are older uh, than that. That's an, an, an interesting thing. And again at Peshmel, another view that you don't see very much, uh, it seems that these were lit up to be seen from a distance in the cave. Again, as little tableaus, uh, if you like, these are the only ones there. We can also see that animals are depicted as they emerge from uh, cracks like the famous falling horse from Lascaux. We've already seen the Chevalskis one there. Imagine it in very low light. This is just blackness and the horse is falling out of it. Rather like, I think, it's being born. And also, very famously in Altamira, uh, we have at least 27 bison and some does and horses uh, on the ceiling. Uh, they're depicted on what's usually described as lying down. This one could be a carcass, actually, it's so stiff. But usually lying down, uh, sleeping, uh, or whatever. That's the interpretation that's usually made. Actually, one thing bison might do is peeing on the ground and then rolling it. But funny enough, you never get that coming up in coffee table books. But uh, the reason why they've been depicted or some of them are, is because they follow the contours. Can you just see it here? of natural bosses in the ceiling. Now we simulate low lines. You can see these bosses. So the bison are drawn because these bosses resemble the shape of a bison curled up, or not really its own pee or something like that. It seems to me that in Altamira, the bison are literally dripping out of the ceiling, rather like water uh, through stalactite columns. And also we have what I would interpret as attempts occasionally to fix shadows. This is me uh, in El Castillo, approximating the position of hand stencils, and note, of course, uh, my um, shadows there too. Now imagine that moving uh, in the flickering light of the cave. So you know, I think there's enough circumstantial evidence to show that shadows were the context of this art. So I'll just say a little bit about hand stencils because this is something close to my own interests and they are emerging to be the oldest form of art. And they're interesting in my opinion because conceptually they're neither really non-figurative because they show a hand, but they're not really figurative in the sense that somebody hasn't set out to figure a hand. So they are conceptually in between, I suggest at least. Anyway, we have uh, our latest count of these, uh, has them in 37 caves, about two thirds of which uh, are in France. And when we take a proper look at the chronology for them, uh, they are at least 27,000 years old. Some, in some cases, like I've shown over 40, and as I say, the picture uh, will change later this year. They can be produced by spitting people out of the mouth. In one cave, Ardeles, we have right beneath one of them uh, this nice little grinder uh, set, stained in ochre, with a bone chew. This is me using a so-called aerogram and looking stupid. Believe you me, it looks stupid. You hold the pigment in a wet pigment in a shell. You put a bird bone chew, or in this case a reed, um, in the bottom of it, a bit like a pipe and then you blow over the top of that. So rather like you're blowing over the top of a Coca-Cola bottle, you get a strange sound uh, and it creates a vacuum and that sucks up the spray. It's really difficult to do. You get this really weird whizzing sound, like so. You feel lightheaded and look stupid as well. So make of that what you will. And uh, you, get the, you get the knack fairly quickly, but it has to be said it's quite easier 
uh, just to put the pigment in your mouth uh, and spray it, or just through one tube, like my colleague is doing now. But this is interesting, it's very easy to cover your hand in pigment and slap it on a surface, like most children do uh, today. But who would come up with this idea, you know, which is a very odd way of doing things uh, in my mind? And most importantly, why do we find that in Indonesia at roughly the same minimum age as we find in Europe? Well, research really on hand stencils has sadly focused for half a century on whether they show whether we're right-handed uh, or not, and whether they're male or female based on figure ratios and so on. Uh, suffice it to say that depends on what way round they are, when you create them, uh, and sometimes finger attenuations, as I call it, missing fingers that I would do, um, can be created face down. Usually the argument is when we have these, to get such a sharp uh, line, your palm would have to be up. Consequently, you can't use it for saying whether it's right or left hand, uh, but this is clearly one I produce from palm down, so you can get quite a sharp. Even somebody as naff as me uh, at it can get quite a sharp image. But what I'm interested in actually is the kind of decision making processes that occur. I notice incidentally you've got a workshop next month about symbolism, and the backdrop picture is a hand stencil uh, actually. Whether these are symbols or not, well, clearly they're signs of human hands, I assume, but, uh, and so on. But I'm interested in whether this is random placement or whether there's a greater meaning <coughs> to it. Some cases, they, you know, in all of the available surfaces, uh, they can choose very difficult uh, places of access. This one here is up this horrible slope. Uh, it's above, placed deliberately above the door code. You have to adopt a position like this. It's a very humid cave. Uh, and I counted about 380 metres in, and pretty nasty haul it is, too when you can just do it outside, you know, clearly uh, there's a reason for this. Similarly, these are often placed in little crawl spaces. There's another one in Gargas in the French Pyrenees, and one of these things. Is that a shut up now kind of thing? Right, okay. Five minutes? Yeah. Is that it? Is that it? Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Very difficult to access, as you see here. Lots of deliberate placements, particularly with finger dots that we get here too. Possibly concerned with navigating, with formal ways of exploring these caves, all different positions, often quite difficult to do. Coffee table books don't show you this kind of thing. You're enveloped by these positions uh, here. This has to involve two people. These can probably be pairings creating uh, these here. So lots of context and associations with art as well. This isn't random, yeah, and uh, you know, you do get to, uh, uh, to experience uh, other aspects of it too. Now, what I've done is quantify the type of associations they have. You often find lots of cracks and crevices and so on. Uh, whether they're on stalactites and this sort of thing. This is my uh, group here. I've applied this in several caves subsequently, but this is two from Cantabria. You can see, if we forget the 25% or so that don't have associations, uh, m many of them are placed in uh, either uh, situations where the palm fits over a concavity, what I call ergonomic, or a gripping position, which is where the fingers are actually gripping a boss, rather like you're steadying yourself in that quite tactile <coughs> exploration. Suffice it to say, there is a real meaning to this. Look at this crack here that approximates the edge of a human hand. Lo and behold, there's a stencil created on it. This one here, I don't know if you can make it out, is placed right in the middle of a concavity. This kind of thing is really deliberate. You know, this isn't just random graffiti and so on. So, we're walking through uh, these. As we come through, the last point I want to make is about observation. And I'll just show you these because there's a couple of nice little slides. We get these wonderfully detailed weight ends of prop observers, spear throwers, uh, here, particularly from the French uh, Pyrenees, particularly the does. We've seen the jumping horse from Brunicamp. And we get this lovely theme that probably was created by one 
uh, sculpture, as it were, the so-called uh, fawn and bird uh, theme, as you can see, fawn looking back, something coming out of its rear with a bird on it. Some people call this the bird and turd uh, <laughs> theme. This is not a deer turd, uh, if any of you have seen deer turds. I'd like to think it's something a little sweeter. Uh, and actually, these were excavated, would you believe, after uh, the film Bambi uh, came out. So, you know, a totally different inspiration. What they show almost certainly um, is actually birth. Uh, you can see this uh, lovely image here. Well, that is the wrong one. Uh, the birth is looking back there, another one there too. And I've never been able to find a picture of it. I saw one once. Corvids, ravens and crows, actually swoop down and feed on the corn of emerging, um, whatever you call it, don't, emerging deer uh, young. So I think we're seeing actual real, real observations uh, occurring there too. Anyway, I know it's called past, so I'd better shut up uh, at that point. But I hope I can give you a feel for the thought that's going into this. These aren't just kind of nice images and so on, they're contextualised uh, in a lot more. 